Welcome. Aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii, Time for Responsible Change. And today we're going to talk some about where the U.S. Supreme Court decision on affirmative action leaves us, where it's headed, and what might be constructive ways to address that and respond to it. And we have with us, back for the first time since April, Rebecca Ratliff, a wonderful JAMS mediator, arbitrator, longtime senior claim executive and knowledgeable and respected in the insurance industry and the ADR conflict resolution industry nationally and internationally. Tina Patterson, who also has national and international experience in business consulting and is also a leading mediator and arbitrator. And David Larson, professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, immediate past chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution, and a pioneer in court online dispute resolution, bringing access to justice to people through online court processes. So, <clears throat> wonderful group here. <clears throat> Having read through the decision that the Chief Justice wrote for the Supreme Court <clears throat> in the affirmative action case, <clears throat> which has now held that affirmative action programs violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and are not lawful. Where does that leave us? Well, at least it's confused. Um, you know, there was this that little, that little escape clause that was put in there saying that, well, you could still consider a applicant's explanation of how race affected his or her personal life, what challenges it created, and there go, there go the confusion, because you're not supposed to consider race, but if an applicant writes about how race impacted their lives, then I guess you're considering race. So if you're on an admissions committee and you're trying to decide um, what factors can I look at, I think you're left with some confusion. And the problem is there are groups lining up that are saying, you know, we're watching you now. And uh, we're going to sue you if we see any evidence that you've taken race into account in your admissions. And in my school, we've received those kinds of threats. And I imagine pretty much every school is receiving them. So there's a, there's a lot of intimidation going on. Well, in the history of affirmative action, in the Baki case back in 1971, the first one that really approved it, we had four opinions saying... Affirmative action was okay as a remedial measure to correct racial discrimination against minorities. We had four saying it wasn't. And then we had Justice Powell writing what turned out to be the swing vote and eventually getting later accepted as the significant opinion, whatever that means, <clears throat> saying, no, but diversity is a legitimate constitutional basis for colleges to factor race in as one element in the admissions process. And since then, the resistance to that has been looking for ways. Now we're at a point where if you read the opinion carefully, <clears throat> it looks like they are, and Chief Justice Roberts is, setting it up to undercut that diversity justification in future cases. Am I off base on that? Or was that a sense that you folks also got from this opinion? Well, well, I think Chuck's right. And I think that, you know, there have been a different attempted justifications for affirmative action. Um, and diversity is one of them, that there's value to having a diverse population for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that when you come out of school, like it or not, you can run, but you can't hide. The, uh, the United States is ethically and racially diverse. You're going to live in a place that is racially and ethically diverse, and you have to be able to be comfortable there, um, 
work effectively and productively in that environment, and hopefully school can prepare you for that. So that's a that's a strong reason to say that, yeah, we want to have our, our schools integrated. We want to have them diverse. Um, when you think about a firm of action, so that's, that's, at least in the educational context, that's been one of the accepted justifications. When you get move over to the employment, really the only accepted justification, and that hasn't that has not been accepted, is um is kind of a past sins model or a past sins paradigm. That is, if you can demonstrate that you're in a historically segregated area, um, that where your occupation or workplace or industry is, um, then you might be able to engage in affirmative action. But it's really a past sins paradigm. And um you, you the only justification is if you can point to past sins. And then if that's the only justification, then you get the immediate pushback that I wasn't, I didn't do any sins. I wasn't around when all these things happened historically. I'm not a sinner. And because I'm not a sinner, you shouldn't be able to impose affirmative action on me. And so you get caught in that kind of trap. And so long as there's a resistance to accept any other kind of justification under equal protection, that's that's the conflict in affirmative action. What's what's concerning to me, and um, I, I've had a lot of conversations about this, and um, mostly we're speechless, um, as you said, David, when you began. Um, it's confusing, um, but you know, I'm concerned with the points that you've just made. I'm concerned about the domino effect. I mean, we. Um, you you can't win for losing is a saying that we used to hear. Um, and so there are all these loops. Um, and as you said, if, if, you know, we come up with um, a reason for, for why um, or how minority experiences should be considered, then, you know, there's, you know, there are laws being put in place. I mean, Florida is, is um, just making some incredible law right now um, to make sure that you just can't win for losing anywhere where it appears that an argument might be able to be made to give advantage uh, to people in disparate condition. Um, it just, uh, it, it just, it appears that you, you just, there's, the legislation, um, the legislate, the the legislation doesn't support um, the. I'm trying. I'm trying to. Uh, the legislation that exists and legislated le legislation that's coming doesn't support um, equal justice for minorities, and and so this is this is a step back. Um, I'm concerned about the instability. Um, that this is creating, um, and before the show started, Chuck was talking about education, employment, and housing. It's not just um, education. So, you know, in addition to um, the, the points that you've brought up, David, we also have to be concerned about the domino effect that happened because of COVID. So there's all kinds of instability that exists in um, communities where um, they are underserved uh, in so many areas. And now the question um, returns uh, as to whether or not those, the people in those communities can educate, get their children educated. I mean, it's just, it's like this vicious cycle. Um, we've, we've moved backwards and I'll admit it, it does have me speechless because I don't know what's going to happen. Um, so it's, it's even, it's just hard for me to even articulate the concern that I have around um, this uh, reversal. Well, and there's another element in the decision, which is both prioritize and emphasize repeatedly, not once, not twice, but many times, which is eh, remedial action programs for discrimination have to end. Eh, and Chief Justice Roberts has been pushing for those to end for years. And now he's got the votes to be able to do it. Eh, so regardless of whatever else is said in the opinion, it's clear that one of the things that this right-wing majority in the Supreme Court has decided to do is to put an end to remedial measures and actions for the results of 
not decades, but centuries of discrimination. And not just racial, but sexual preference, disability, many other kinds, linguistic proficiency. Yeah, Chuck, you used the right, the right adjective. You know, and I've always said that affirmative action is a misnomer. Um, really, what we've always been talking and doing is remedial action, and it's based upon you know, our history of discrimination. And it's not something affirmative, it's we're trying to correct uh, what we've done in the past. Um, uh, to the degree that this court has declared that there's no need for remedial education, it's just stunningly tone deaf. It's like, how, how can you look at America today? How can you watch the evening news? How can you read any kind of print media and think that there's there's no need anymore, that everything's fine, that all discrimination has been overcome, and we can just go forward equally? I, it's just mind-boggling. It really is. It's a matter of seeing that discrimination, that there's no more discrimination and it's no longer needed. It's Oh my gosh, what have we got on our hands? We are now opening the floodgates. We are now having a conversation where we're talking about everything, as Chuck indicated, people who are linguistically diverse, people who are, um, in terms of abilities, ableism, diverse, sexual orientation. These are aspects that we didn't talk about in the 50s, 60s, 70s, in the 20th century. And we're entering the 21st century, and this is a conversation where we have schools who, you know, uh, you don't tell us, we'll pretend it's not happening. Um, where we have students who are of diverse sexual orientation, but, you know, we'll pretend we don't see it because you don't bring it up. And to now say, well, everything's fine. We'll go back to where we were, or um, these programs are no longer needed. It puts the students in jeopardy, but it also puts the schools in a very difficult position because they now know how do, we, how do we maintain the uh, um, matriculation rates for students? Every school wants to make sure that their matriculation rates are at a certain level. When they drop below 40 or 50%, it usually signals there's something going on either with the programming or with how the school is administered, back to this funding of dollars. Um, you know, it, it, this, and I've been listening to the news where schools are now trying to figure out a way to incorporate into their application a question that can vaguely or can be obfuscated to ask this question because they know that if they don't have a diverse um, student population, that the students will suffer in the long term, as you indicated, when they enter the workforce. To go into the workforce and say, oh, I've never met anyone who is fill in the blank is, is both a a shame, and it also indicates that the school has not prepared that student well enough, and we want them to be successful. We want our students to be successful. If this is the model that we're going to create, we're going to see students who are going to go to private institutions and privately funded institutions. I think it also will impact our instructors, and it is impacting our instructors. I had a conversation yesterday. I was delivering a class on unconscious bias, and the group was adamant do not record this session. And why? Because some of them were at institutions where the conversation regarding diversity, equity, inclusion, and unconscious bias was forbidden and had un unwelcoming con uh, consequences. So, you know, I, I, we're, I think we're navigating, trying to navigate this as carefully as possible. But at the end of the day, I see both the students as well as the schools being harmed. And I also see that this becomes now a Every state determines how they want to address this, especially for those state-funded schools. Well, and that's you know, a great insight. Yeah, David, go ahead. Let's say, Tina, um, this takes us a little away from affirmative slash remedial action, but talking a little bit about the, the curriculum. And, um, you know, tied to all of this is this whole myth of indoctrina indoctrination, that somehow there's woke indoctrination in the schools. And that's been a big thing with, with Governor DeSantis in Florida. They're going to stop woke indoctrination. But it's really a it's a it's a misrepresentation of what indoctrination means. I mean, indoctrination means that you are insisting 
that students accept as truth something that's professionally contestable, that you have to accept it as truth. That's not the same thing as introducing concepts and opening up a discussion. You know, so long as you leave the opportunity for students to provide an alternative perception or to challenge whatever you're asserting, uh, even though you might come from a particular political position, that's not indoctrination. Um, you know, and you know, so that so the drumbeat has been that whenever you address particular subjects, that mere fact of addressing the subject is is going to somehow so so influentially uh, affect the student's perception that we got to bar it right from the outset. There was an interesting study with the University of North Carolina. Seven thousand students showed that you know from the time they started as freshmen the time they graduated, there actually was pretty little change in their political perception. Um, they didn't suddenly become raging liberals or aggressive um, conservatives. It didn't happen. Um, they came in with pretty set ideas. But the one thing that did change is they became a little more tolerant of different positions. And that should be a goal. That should be a good thing. So uh, again, one of the terribly disturbing things of what's happened in schools now is I think I think concepts are being misrepresented. Higher education was to be to help students form critical thinking skills. I did not say I did not say critical race theory. I said critical thinking skills so that you could hear a, a commentary put before you, uh, recognize it as satire, recognize it as someone actually presenting information, and you are not supposed to agree with it wholesale. You are supposed to look at it and say, these are pieces that I agree with. These are pieces I don't agree with. I have formed my own opinion. And that narrative seems to be getting lost. I, I, it's interesting. You mentioned the, um, this term indoctrination. I'm very much aware of a school on the West Coast that one of their leaders told um, a conservative art newspaper, it was a newspaper, the ma magazine, Project 1619 is indoctrination, and this is one of the reasons why the U.S. is in the position that it's in now. Not maybe, but Project 1619 is leftist indoctrination. And instead, let students read the book. Let them explore the concepts. They, eat, they can agree, they can disagree, but this opportunity for critical thinking is being set aside. And I, it makes me wonder, I think young people are vigorous enough that they will find a way they're innovative enough but if our institutions of higher learning are literally trying to shut down the opportunity to ex expand and know what it means to be a critical thinker we're in trouble well said tina um so much of um you know what what we're saying here about um basically canceling the truth canceling uh, the real narrative and just making up a narrative um, is not going to go over well with the next generation. We've said before in some of our other sessions that this is the generation that does not bow to tyranny. They will find a way um, to, uh, to, to bring the truth forward and to, to continue in truth. In Florida, you have four HBCUs, four historically black colleges and universities. So in, in those institutions, um, well, and, and, and obviously other institutions, but I'm sp speaking specifically about HBCUs because they are majority black and brown students, minority students. Um, these institutions were founded to educate freed slaves because they weren't allowed in mainstream stream educational institutions. And so we're, you know, you have um, to consider specifically historically black colleges and universities in a state where black history is being canceled um, or, and changed. I, I can't say canceled or changed. I would have to say canceled and changed. Um, it's, it's very disturbing. And, and, and as uh, we've pointed out in this conversation, there's a need for um, our students in education, uh, in the educational system, uh, in, the, in the higher learning context, to be able to, to have a discussion, to get information, to think. Um, through it to, ha you know, have conversations where um, they can learn from one another. Um, you know, they have different backgrounds, students have different backgrounds. It's, it's just a very disturbing time in history um, that 
you know, diversity initiatives are being canceled. Uh, and, you know, and the history uh, as it really happened is, is being changed uh, in order to create a narrative that makes a certain, uh, a certain group of people comfortable. It's really very scary. You know, my, my understanding is that, at least I, at least I believe, that in a democracy, we need critical thinkers. Um, we need people that can, can, can take in information and uh, assess it and make judgments about it. And, you know, in July 2023, um, we're going to need more critical thinkers because we're in a period of AI. And AI's ability to present information in very credible ways, to use images, to use voice, um, to make it seem exactly like I'm saying something in front of you when I never said that, um, it'll be almost, it will be indistinguishable. And now it's going to be just a question of, do you know the source? And, and does that content sound right? Now, is that something that this person would be saying? Uh, so I, I, I fear that to the degree that we're not asking our students to be critical thinkers, that we're going to have a, a, a deficiency in our ability to kind of sort through uh, the information that's coming to us and it's going to come to us in, in more persuasive and deceptive ways than we've ever imagined. And we really need to be prepared for that. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing I wanted to mention, picking up on what Rebecca said about, about history being changed, uh, one thing that I don't want to smile because it's 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 kind of horrifying. But in Florida, uh, students now are going to be instructed that there were they have to have to be instructed that if you're going to talk about slavery, you have to talk about the benefits of slavery. It's like are it's like are you serious? It's like talk about the skills that you learned as a slave and how that could benefit you. How is it going to benefit you? You know, you're going to go out in the market and get clients now that you've learned a skill. Is that how slavery works? You can start a business. But that's not how it works. Um, the idea that somehow you're going to benefit from slavery is, it's just, it's its insulting um, and it's frightening. And I think that we're telling little kids that, um, uh, to me, it's unimaginable. Completely, a completely, complete revision. And it also dismisses the work that was done of abolitionists and those yes. who, who literally wanted to make um, make the truth be known about the horrific um, images, the horrific lifestyle, and the people, the lives that were lost and damaged as a result. I mean, for generations. I mean, this is you know Chuck said it earlier. Not just not for decades, but for centuries. 1619 was over 400 years ago when the first enslaved Africans were brought, um, you know, uh, went through the, uh, the the transatlantic slave trade and were brought over to America. Uh, the my originally uh, my my original ancestry I did a uh, ancestry DNA and my original ancestry is 70% West African Ghana and um, and Nigeria and then some a smattering of some East Africa. Um, and other places, you know, other uh, African countries. Um, and then the map takes us over to Europe. Now, I wasn't there, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that this big um, group of, of my ancestors didn't go over to, uh, to Europe voluntarily. Uh, they were taken from their home. And I mean, the history of how the slave trade was done and, um, you know, what happened to those people has affected us uh, all over the world generationally. It is, uh, you know, we, we're, we've, we've moved backwards with this new legislation. You know, hearing this, it makes me think about every person of color, those who are of African ancestry, but also our First Nation people who literally were marched from East Coast to West Coast and told to adapt. It also makes me think about those who came in later waves, especially those who came from what we would consider Asian countries and, and the treatment. And just literally, this is why I keep saying revisionist history, because it's literally just saying, you know, none of this happened, folks. Ignore the man behind the curtain. Everything, everybody was happy. We all got along. 
and it was this Norman Rockwellian community. But if you read books like The Warmth of Other Suns, or you read about the Red Terror, you know that this was not the case. And to literally hide all of that, every single one of us who's a person of color becomes a hidden figure. Well, and it's like it's like the saying, um, if you can read, thank a teacher. And here we're saying, if you have an occupation or if you <laughs> if you have a trade or if you own a business, thank slavery. Because, yeah, this is how we taught black people who, by the way, already had businesses and everything else over in Africa and their original land. Um, we taught the people over here how to build. The White House was built at the hand of slaves. There's so, you know, so much of our country that was built by the hands of slaves, you know. So, yeah, we we taught, <laughs> um, and I'm speaking in solidarity, but those enslaved Africans um, were a big part of the system that taught um, people in America how to build and how to do business. But were kept from all the benefit. But they were kept out from all the benefits uh, of of having a owning a business and building a business, and the economic system. And maybe that's a key part of the core connection. You've got hundreds of years of history of non-white Americans being treated incredibly inhumane, brutally inhumane, subhuman. <clears throat> And you've now got the people who are from that dominant group who are not going to be the predominant demographic group in the next 25 years or so, <clears throat> who are saying, we're not going to acknowledge that. We're not going to remediate it. We're not going to correct it. In fact, we're going to exactly, as you said, reverse and revise any stories that are inconsistent with our primacy. You can't go back there. It's not necessarily going back. It's not going forward. It's like, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to hang on to, to the bitter end. You know, I'm not going to adapt. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to evolve. I, I kind of like the way things were. You know, I like to have more opportunities that I don't want to let it go. Um, you know, so as we think about uh, what the U.S. Supreme Court has done, I, I, you know, I hope that people still think about the value of diversity. And uh, maybe it's going to be a little harder to expose our kids to it based on what's happening in the schools, but that's not 24-7. You know, a lot happens outside the schools. And, uh, you know, I hope that if you believe or sense that your, your, your kids are not getting the kind of education you'd like them to have, that we can take a little responsibility on themselves to, to expose our kids to different environments, um, different populations, because we can do it. Um, it doesn't have to all be on the schools. So on the one hand, let's work hard to make sure schools do recognize the value of diversity and don't let us let, let the courts pull us back. But on the other hand, um, take some responsibility to make sure that, that we introduce our, children's, uh, our children to diverse cultures. Exactly. And in our last minute, Rebecca, any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with on this? You can't legislate a mentality. People who believe um, that other groups of people should be subjugated, um, there's, we can only we can only fight that. I mean, we, we can't, you know, apparently when there's a, ma a majority that um, is in favor of keeping uh, confusion and keeping people uh, separated. Uh, it's, you know, we just have to continue to speak out against it. We are in the midst of social revolution. This conversation is not ending. This is just the beginning. What a great way to leave us. Thank you all for joining us. Think Tech Hawaii hey, gives us some thought. Share it with the people who matter to you. And remember that in 25 years, we're not going to also only be a country of more non-white people than white people. We will be a country in which the proportion of people who are of mixed ethnicity and race and sexual preference and other differences will be far greater. That will be the majority. 
how do we enable life to be one that respects the humanity of all of us? Thank you all. Thank Tech Hawaii. Aloha and be well. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.